Bruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to you all to our house. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to give a lecture on what I call planting seeds. You know, this week in my thoughts, I'd like to discuss actually rewards in this world. How God, our benevolent Father in heaven, files certain mitzvot, especially those that we perform without any thought or of reward. He keeps them in his treasury vault, knowing that the time would come when we would need the reward. All of this is done without our forethought or our knowledge. Now, the Talmud in the Tractate of Kedushin uh, states that there is no reward for a mitzvah in this world. So the question becomes, so what are all the blessings that are mentioned in the Torah? So the Rambam explains, Maimonides, that rewards are mentioned in the Torah only as a means by which we are able to fulfill the mitzvot completely, and not really as a payment for doing them. Okay, so how do we understand the statement of the Rambam? Uh, think of it as a person who was employed and gets paid once every two weeks. If he needs money, what he does before he receives his paycheck, he requests an advance from his employer. And so too, our reward for mitzvot that we, that we perform in this world is set aside for the payday that we will receive when we reach the next world. However, in the meantime, God Almighty allows us to take advances, so to speak, so we can continue to perform mitzvot daily. You know, I read a true story that I think brings out this point very well, how God saves our rewards. And the story took place in Israel true story, in the early 2000s. Gadi Ramon was serving in the IDF and he was stationed outside of Ramallah. It was very early in the morning and he was shot by an Arab terrorist. Since it was so early in the morning, no one heard the shot and Gadi lay on the ground unconscious and slowly bleeding to death. But it just so happened nearby Shlomo Bergman was also stationed and he heard the shot. So he went to investigate. What he found was Gadi lying on the ground unconscious in a pool of his own blood. Well, he immediately called for assistance and quickly applied pressure to the wound until help arrived. His quick actions saved Gadi's life. He literally held Gadi's life in his hands. Now, both Gadi and his parents wanted to thank the soldier that saved his life. But try as they could, they could not locate the name of the soldier. Somehow, no one had recorded who he was. So Tamar Ramon, Gadi's mother, felt that until she would be able to personally thank the soldier that saved her beloved son's life and express her sincere gratitude, that she would be left with an empty feeling inside. So after many attempts and failures, so she struck on an idea. The couple owned a grocery store in Ashtad, so they decided to put a, a sign up in their front window describing what happened to Gadi. Since Israel is a small country, they hoped that someone would recognize the story and lead them to the mystery soldier. You know, a year passed by. There was no response. Then one day, a year later, a woman who was from out of town came into the store. As she was leaving, she noticed a sign on the window and she recalled how happy her son Shlomo had been when he had come home one Friday night and told them how he had saved the life of another soldier. So she turned around and went back into the store and told Tamar Ramon the story that her son had told her. Well, the stories matched, and the two women fell into each other's arms, and they both cried. The two families set up a meeting, and at the meeting, all that Gadi's mother could say to Shlomo was, you saved my world. Well, she thought this was the end of the story, but it was far from over. After the tears subsided, Anat, Shlomo's mother, asked to talk to Tamar in, in private. She looked at her and said, don't you recognize me? Tamar just shook her head and said, no. She asked Anat, have we ever met before? To which Anat answered, <laughs> yes, we have. And that began to explain. She said, you see, I lived in this neighborhood many years ago. So as I was passing by your store the other day, I thought that I would give you some business. Truth is, I can't believe that you are the mother of the soldier that my son saved. You see, 
20 years ago. I used to live around the corner and I would come into your grocery store to buy my bread and milk. One day when I was in the, the store, you noticed that I looked troubled and you were nice enough to ask me why I seemed so sad. I don't know why, but for some reason I felt that I needed to confide in you. So I told you that I was going through a difficult time and in addition that I was pregnant and planning to have an abortion. When I said the word abortion, well, you immediately called over your husband and it seemed that the two of you just completely forgot about your business and were concerned only about me and my present situation. You spoke to me about how things get better and about the joy of being a mother. You said to me the most beautiful word that you can hear in the Hebrew language is ima, mother. You both talked to me until I was convinced that I needed to keep this baby. I gave birth to a baby boy. 20 years ago, you saved my son Shlomo by talking me out of an abortion. And now, the boy that you saved is the same person who saved your precious son Gadi's life, the seeds that we plant. Our sages tell us there's no reward from miss in this world, that all of our reward is set aside for us in the next world, what I call our 401k, our heavenly retirement account. On the other hand, our sages do say that there is reward for forethought that we attach to the deed, also for the extra effort or, or money spent to make the mitzvah even more special, what we refer to as hidur mitzvah, beautifying a mitzvah. There are many times that we say or do something for another person, and, and we really don't think that it was really so special. However, to the recipient of our action, it may have meant the world to them. There are times you just knowing that someone else cares is enough to make us feel better in times of distress. There are kindnesses that we perform that influence our lives, again, many years later. There's a good friend of mine who had recently lost his mother. At the time, we had just met at a health club. He wasn't religious at the time, and we talked and I offered my condolences on his loss. I spoke to him for a short time, trying to comfort him since he seemed deeply troubled by her passing. After we parted, I, I really never gave it a second thought. Years later, he had joined my synagogue and we became the best of friends. One day he took me aside and with tears in his eyes, he told me that today was his mother's yard site, the anniversary of her death. He wanted to thank me again for the words that I had said to him at the health club when she had first passed away, you know. Truth is, I was moved, but, in, but if, he had, if he would have asked me to repeat what I had told him on that day, well, I would have been hard-pressed to remember. But he remembered the seeds that we plant. You know, both my parents were Holocaust survivors. My mother was only a 13-year-old girl when she was liberated from the camp. And she married my father, who was only 18. She gave birth to me when she was 14 years old and had two more children before she was 18. My father was in and out of institutions from the time that I was five years old. And so we lived on welfare for most of my childhood. We were living in an old Jewish neighborhood in Detroit that had turned black and we had little hope of moving out of that neighborhood. However, my mother had an aunt who lived in a two-family flat in a nice Jewish neighborhood in northwest Detroit. They lived in the upstairs unit while her elderly in-laws lived in the downstairs unit. It happened that my mother's aunt had a brother in Philadelphia who was in the delicatessen business and he had offered to give her one of his locations. Well, she was excited about the opportunity. However, she was in a dilemma as to what to do with her elderly in-laws who would take care of them. And so she reached out to my mother and asked her if she would be willing to move into the upstairs flat so that my mother could take care of her elderly in-laws. My mother was only too happy to oblige. I mean, for one, she was a wonderful, caring, warm, and giving person. And at the same time, it was our ticket out of a bad neighborhood in Detroit. And so my mother's aunt moved her family to Philadelphia and we moved into her flat, nothing being an accident. The house was just three blocks down from the street, from the delicatessen that I worked in 
from the age of 15 bussing dishes. Ten years later, I would eventually take over the ownership of that same deli, which I still own today. That was when I was about 12 years old. When I was 21, I was drafted to the U.S. Army and I served my tour of duty at Fort Dix, New Jersey, which was strange since I'd expected to be sent to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where most of the recruits from Michigan were sent. But during my tour of duty, I would often visit my aunt in Philadelphia. In fact, for the last six months of my tour, I actually moved into her house and commuted back and forth to the base. It was only a 40-minute drive. Not only was she the sweetest of people, <laughs> she was a great cook with a deli. Visiting her was truly my pleasure. It just so happened that her house was a kind of halfway house for kids. She had two children, a boy and a girl, and there was always some kids at the house. So it was her house, at her house, that I met my wife of 53 years. A friend of mine who was serving in the U.S. Air Force had taken her out for a date and they wound up at my aunt's house. It just so happened that at the time my wife was seriously dating someone in town. However, he had gone away to, on a trip to Europe for three weeks. Well, when he returned, he was no longer part of her life. She calls our relationship love at first fright the long arm of God. If, he hadn't been if I hadn't been drafted into the U.S. Army and stationed in New Jersey, and if my aunt hadn't moved to Philadelphia originally, I wouldn't have met my wife. But the story doesn't end there. About 15 years later, both, of my, both my aunt and uncle had passed away, and my single cousin was living in Philadelphia by herself. So my wife and I invited her to come live in Detroit. She lived with us for about a year. And then she moved into her own condo. I offered her a job and she worked as a bookkeeper in my office for about 20 years. Now that she is retired, we have returned the favor. She has developed dementia and we are now both her primary caretakers. All that goes around comes around. Nothing in life is an accident. The seeds that we plant. You know, it's written in the Torah in connection with the Akedus Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac that Abravino, Abraham, our father, as he was traveling towards his destination to bring his son Yitzhak up as a sacrifice to God, well, there it states, that he, Abraham, saw the Mokum, the place from a distance. One of the terms that we use to describe God Almighty is Mokum, the place. This is an allusion to the fact that God is not in this world but rather the world is within God. Our commentary is telling us that Abba Vina was in constant communication with God. He was always aware of God's presence. However, during the test of the Akedah, somehow God removed his presence so as to make Abba's test more difficult. So though Abba Vina may not have felt God's presence in that moment, he looked back at his life, and there in the past, he saw God's presence clearly. He therefore concluded that just as God had been with him in the past, so too was he with him in the present situation. So even though Abba may not have been privy to an open revelation at that moment, nonetheless he was certain that it existed. With absolute faith he believed that God Almighty, his benevolent Father in Heaven, would never abandon him. You know, I challenge anyone to look back at their life, and if you do, then you too, will see clearly the hand of God who is directing you on your journey through this world. All the events in our lives are orchestrated by God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, where we live, where we work, who our parents are, who our children are, our friends, our neighbors. Whether we are rich or poor, nothing in life is an accident. God Almighty is the ultimate programmer. Yes, we do have free will, however, it is God Almighty who prepares the play that we are all required to perform in. We do not get to choose. It is He who decides which part we are all best suited to play. More often than not, we are short-sighted. We only observe those facts that are in front of our eyes, the obvious. Many times, we forget to connect the dots, our past. As it states in Perkyo the Ethics of the Fathers, 
Rabbi Shimon said that the most important trait that a person can possess is haroa esanolet, one who considers the consequences of their actions. What is interesting is that the Hebrew word nolet is past tense. Rav Shimon is telling us that the only way for a person to truly know the future is by first looking into their past. All events in our lives are interwoven like one large tapestry. One event connected to the next, all together. They weave the garment that we call our life. You know, I believe that this all connects with the world that we live in today. Though we may not have realized it, it would seem that throughout all the previous generations, the seeds of the Messiah have already been planted. Looking back in our history, we can easily see the hand of God, our benevolent Father in heaven, protecting and directing us towards our final destination. Hopefully, it is our generation that will constitute the last piece of that puzzle, so that the seed of the Messiah that was planted will sprout forth with the final redemption. So let us all pray for a quick and decisive victory in Gaza with the destruction of not only Hamas, but with all the evil that exists in the world today. May God Almighty safely return all the hostages, cure all the sick and injured, comfort all the mourners, and return safely all the brave IDF soldiers together with the coming of Mashiach, Zikainu, quickly and in our time. Let it be now. Again, let me thank you again for attending. And we bless you all again with health and happiness and safety. Um, there will not be a class next week. Again, next week is the holiday of Shavuot. Again, and again, when we receive the Torah on Mount Sinai, um, we have a belief that on every holiday, the power, the spirituality that existed at that time exists again at that same way it was when they received the Torah. So let us all again once again, say Nasib and Ishma, we will do and we will listen to God Almighty and let him bring the final redemption. Again, please uh, push the uh, like button, subscribe, and share again with your friends. Let me once again thank you and again bless you and your family with a happy holiday. You should only know from good. Again, thank you for attending.